ecological success story, and I think that's really cool. Um, so I I um, I can get excited about this. So I hope I hope I don't digress too much. I'll try to be efficient. But um, uh, let me tell you uh, a little of what we know about the about these fish and about this migration. So the two species uh, in question are two closely related species. One is alewife, and one is blueback herring. Um, they're uh, found in rivers and coastal waters and the open ocean, uh, as we'll see. Um, uh, and they are, they have this behavior of being anadromous or um, migratory, where they make a transition from living uh, in salt water the most of their time uh, to freshwater to spawn. The spawning season is March to June. People have seen river herring on the Cape. They arrive later in the mystic um, watershed. And they used to be, in any case, um, and in many ways still are, economically and ecologically very significant. The, um, there used to be a big fishery of, of river herring, um, but it's also true that they are important to food webs, both in the ocean in, and in freshwater ecosystems. Um, and uh, on land, right? So it's a, it's a, um, it's a, because they make this transition from ocean to inland waters for a substantial amount of time, they're, they're interacting with, um, with uh, different habitats and different ecosystems and lots of things eat uh, river herring um, from striped bass to bald eagles and osprey and, um, and uh, more. Uh, so, as I say, they make they have this um, migratory lifestyle and the uh, life history. And so there's this there's this diagram that shows um, you know imagine um, whoops imagine that you start here. They're in the ocean foraging most of the year. When uh, spring comes, they make their way back. Uh, to the river they were born in with really high fidelity. It's a, an amazing thing, like salmon, um, not quite so site specific in their in their spawning location, uh, people think as salmon, but very loyal to the river they were born in. They spawn, uh, the adults spawn at, in um, freshwater systems and lakes and streams, and they return to the ocean uh, there's the new understandings of how long they stay in the lakes. Um, they thought they left almost immediately. They probably leave a little later than they thought, but um, but the the eggs are left behind and um, emerge and grow in these in these lake freshwater environments. And so, uh, by the end of the season, by the end of the summer, the young migrate out to estuaries and then out to the ocean again. Um, to join schools of river herring um, in the ocean uh, foraging. Um, it, it's interesting that, an interesting aside, and I won't get, I won't digress here, but this is a really unusual behavior. So only one person, less than, than percent of fish species are, diadro are, are diadromous, which is a more generalized term that refers to either they live in salt water and go to freshwater to spawn or vice versa. It's a rare thing to have evolved. And there's an interesting uh, uh, kind of debate in the literature about what, how this would have evolved and for what reasons, but I won't, I won't digress there. Uh, but this happens sort of hidden from view, but a sort of uh, uh, right past our, our homes and businesses in the, in the Mystic River every year. And the, the sort of uh, conservation context, um, the reason this is, part of the reason this is an important story is that these are uh, threatened species. So this is, um, and there's been a huge population decline in recent decades. So this is a graph, not of population per se, it requires a little interpretation, but of commercial landings that is of fish um, catches over many decades from late 19th century to uh, 
roughly the present. And um, you can see this, um, you know, the, the, you have to interpret the slope upward on the left-hand side of the graph cautiously because that what, what that's really, should, the reason the numbers keep going up are not because probably there are more river herring, but because there are more people and more efficient, um, uh, even ruthlessly efficient at by the end uh, fishing techniques. And what you see is that the sort of peak in the early 70s, there were changes in, um, uh, in the rules that govern uh, foreign fishing vessels in, um, in the 200 mile buffer around uh, US coastal waters. In any case, a variety of factors uh, summarized by the word overfishing um, caused this huge collapse and a very characteristic collapse in, in um, uh, fish populations. It's, you know, like all Atlantic fisheries look like this, cod looks like this, other, many others. So it, it, the first and kind of primary threat to these populations is overfishing uh, in the ocean. There was a moratorium put on, on fishing, on catching river herring in the 90s. Um, so the, the sort of low plateau at the very end doesn't mean that there hasn't been some recovery because of that. Um, it means it's not legal to catch them anymore. So we're not, this is again a, a, a certain kind of uh, signal in this graph. But the first thing to know is huge population decline because of over harvesting, but at, in the ocean. But they don't spend all their time in the ocean. And so there's another threat to these populations and that is habitat loss in freshwater environments. So these, these fish need fresh water. If you blocked every river, the mouth of every river with um, dams that were impermeable to river herring, imagine you could do that, you can't, but imagine you did that and uh, um, they wouldn't be able to reproduce because their reproduction relies on their getting to fresh water. We haven't done that extreme, like airtight um, sealing up of the coastline, but we have gone very far to doing that. So this is a really kind of cool, very dense graph. Um, I'll just I'll just uh, uh, describe it quickly. If you look at the dots in the map, first of all, they record um, dams that have gone in in New England in the Gulf of Maine since 1630. The um, Charles River. Watertown Dam. It was the first dam uh, built by Westerners in the in in uh, New England rivers, and then the dots re reflect the age of those dams. Right, so the oldest ones are darker, and the lighter ones are uh, more recent. And what you see is that the, the coastline clogs up with dams in the early part of this time series, and building of dams and building of dams in streams, inland streams goes on, you know, for power and, and, and um, uh, other reasons in the 19th century. So, you know, you see this sort of inland march of all these dams and what the graphs show, and this is pretty kind of remarkable. They, they did a calculation like if, if, you, if you put a dam on a river, you can, and, you, and that fish can't get by, Imagine there's there. Uh, it's a five mile long river and a ten mile long river, and you put a dam at five miles. They used to be able to come in five miles, but at ten miles, and now they can only come in five miles. So, just in this made up example, you've reduced the spawning area by half. And so as each of these dams goes in and each of these sort of sub watersheds delineated with these light lines here, they, they keep track of how much inland spawning habitat there are for these fish. And you can see sometimes in, the, where in, in Northern Maine, it took a while, but it, the, the charted uh, streams go down to almost zero habitat in, in that area. Um, it starts high at 100%. These are percentages on the left-hand side and, and they decline. So big picture here is that there are two threats to the populations of these species. And they used to be super abundant. Like the, you know, alewife um, 
Brook and Alewife Reservation and Alewife Tea Station are all named after this fish. And it was Alewife Brook because, you know, the stories in those old days, like many fish stories, they said, you know, you could, when they were running, you could walk across the stream on the backs of these fish. They were super abundant fish, uh, very important. Um, Threats are overfishing in the ocean and, and habitat loss inland as, as shown on this graph. So dams are very important both to the loss of, uh, to the, as a threat, but also as a potential tool of recovery. What happens if you take down the dam or make it uh, allow fish to pass? So let's focus on the Mystic River watershed. There are four dams in question, the Amelia Earhart Dam, at Assembly Row that separates the salt water these days, this is built in the 60s from the what's now fresh, purely freshwater extent of the Mystic River up to Upper Mystic Lake Dam, then a Center Falls Dam in Winchester, and of course the dam at the, at the outlet of Horn Pond. Um, interestingly, you'd think because it's the biggest and sort of the most um, dramatic dam in this system, the Amelia Earhart Dam would be the biggest problem, but it actually isn't. It, oh, because it's, there's tidal, uh, uh, there's a tide on the saltwater side. Um, what, the way the dam works is that it's, it's opening every um, 12 hours to let water out of the Mystic River at low tide. There, and the, the openings are large enough and the, the, the um, openings frequent enough that river herring can make it through. This is a kind of a permeable dam to, to river herring. So they can, they wait until the dam gates open. Um, operators are also instructed to look for schooling fish and, and make sure the dams are open um, and uh, make their way up. The, the real, the first real problem for these fish in this system were, was Upper Mystic Lakes Dam. So, Upper, the problem that existed before 2012, so here, here now we're getting to this very local story, um, was that the upper Mystic Dam prevented river herring who came in through Boston, from the Atlantic Ocean to Boston Harbor, um, uh, uh, under the Tobin Bridge and you know up the Mystic River, they would get to here and they would, uh, uh, there's flow over this dam. So they kept trying to get this way, but it was a, 12 foot drop or something. There's no way they're gonna jump over that dam. So the upper Mystic Dam prevented their use of all upstream habitat for spawning. It prevented the migration. They'll go very far inland, these fish. Um, uh, if you let them, they, they wanna spread out to do their, their spawning. And um, so that was um, since the 19th century, uh, a block to river herring migration. This, this was our old solution or our organization's and community's old solution to this problem. And that was um, a, a bucket brigade where we literally or, organized folks to go out. Um, and you can see that, you know, even kids, um, this beautiful picture by David Messina, who's a big uh, advocate for river herring in our watershed, would they, you'd catch these fish who are trying to go, go, they see this signal of flow here and they want to get upstream. So they're just here waiting to, to get to be um, accessed with this net, they scoop them up in the net, put them in these buckets and then drag the buckets up with the rope and literally just poured them into Upper Mystic Lake. This is Lower Mystic Lake, this is Upper Mystic Lake. So this, solution, this turns out not to be an efficient way to move uh, hundreds of thousands of river herring upstream. The, what the efficient solution is the one that was put in and uh, in 2012 when this dam was rebuilt, it was um, modernized and concrete dam was put in with uh, uh, gates and um, and this fish ladder, which you know in the context of this big building project was a, was a relatively inexpensive intervention. This is this is construction lumber um, uh, construction, you know so. There are a series of steps. The, the picture on the left shows the, the fish ladder, as it's called, without water flowing down it. So the, there's, a, there's a, a gate at the top that's preventing water from, at the, at the bottom of this picture, that's preventing water from flowing down these steps. And we're looking down into Lower Mystic Lake here. Um, 
when they open the water, you get this big rush of water, the constant flow of water down. And now each fish doesn't have to jump 12 feet. They only have to jump uh, one foot from step to step. And that they can do, and they do do uh, it. And, uh, and they work, they congregate again here at the bottom of, uh, at the ladder at Lower Mystic Lake and go up step by step uh, until they finally uh, make their final jump into Upper Mystic Lake at the top. So this ladder was put in in 2012. Um, and um, we started counting fish in 2012. So if you think about it from that map point of view that we were looking at earlier, um, this is just a very rough approximation in, in our system of um, the air spawning area available to river herring um, before this dam, this fish ladder was put in. That was this dark blue area. They couldn't get past that. And so whatever fish eggs they were gonna lay, whatever juveniles would be born, they would be born in this area and then, um, and then leave. Um, uh, after 2012, because of this fish ladder, which they can now use to get upstream, um, the area available, the breeding habitat available to these river herring in 2012, starting in that year, was this, the all of Upper Mystic Lake and, went, and all of Abergena River up to, um, up to Center Falls Dam. And um, so, you know, roughly, the area increased by 60% or, you know, you could, there's, there are tributaries here that are not mentioned, but um, at least by 60%, the area went up. So again, think about that chart of um, habitat loss when you put in a dam. This is essentially habitat expansion when you um, make a dam, you do, haven't removed it, um, uh, but you have made it permeable to fish so they can go upstream. So what happens? So we ran like this, what's cool about this to me is um, that we kind of as a community ran this as a group of communities, ran this experiment um, at, at kind of a watershed scale. What happens if you almost double the breeding habitat to a group of fish that are loyal to your stream? What, what would happen to their population? And the answer is this, um, and forgive me, this, this graph should have been replaced by one that includes 2019 data, um, but it may be a casualty, I couldn't find it, and it could be a casualty to working at home. Um, uh, uh, I couldn't find it on this Saturday, but um, uh, the, the 2019 number I'll tell you was 780,000. So this is actually more, the population at, since 2012, these are number, these are estimated total numbers of fish who went through that fish ladder. Okay. And it's based on observer counts, much as you're going to help us with. And uh, in 2012, it was, it was uh, 200,000 was the estimate. It's now almost 800,000, more than tripled in this short amount of time. And everyone who looks at this graph says, yes, this is the result of habitat expansion, for breeding habitat expansion. It's the, this happened, you tripled the number of fish in the mystic system. The number of fish in the ocean who wanna go back to the mystic river went up by a factor of three because we built that fish ladder. I think that's such a cool thing. And the, there's one detail here that makes this really come alive to me. And that is, um, um, a careful reader of this graph will note that um, in 2012, there were 200,000 fish. 2013, there were 200,000 fish. 200, 2014, there were also 200,000 fish. So what, why, if, if this really is a population recovery from expanded habitat, why did it take till the fourth year? And the really cool answer here is that I left out a piece of the life history of these fish, which is that they sexually mature when they're three or four. So imagine you had in this first year, many more fish loyal, wanting in the ocean, um, one-year-old fish that 
if they were to go back to breed, would go to the Mystic River. They're going to stay in the ocean that first year. The, not only the adult, only the mature adults migrate back. It's true of the second year and the third year. And so what if you were to see a signal, if that first year worked to increase the population of fish loyal to the Mystic River, you would accept, expect to see a signal not in the first three years, but in year four. And we saw this beautiful doubling. This I remember how excited we were to see this number because it, it fits all the details. It's what we were waiting for. And now it's on its way up to 800,000 fish. So anyway, that's, that's, um, that's the ecological re restoration story. It's, we, by the way, I, I'll say here, we only know this because of counts from people like you. So, um, um, oh, there's a question that says, do adult herring die at the end of their spawning? No, no, they, unlike her, unlike, um, unlike uh, salmon, whoops. Sorry, hold on. Unlike salmon, they, the adults go back and come back to breed another year. And they, so um, they, um, they can be as old as seven or eight years old. Um, we don't really know the age structure of the population. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, the division of marine fisheries probably does of the, of our annual migration, but, but no, they, they return. Um, so, Cool, it happens in urbanized Boston. It, it's an incredible success story from a cheap intervention and um, we're really excited about it. We're especially excited about it because of what's next. So the, the, in, um, in uh, a couple of years ago at Center Falls, uh, resident activism, John Kilborn and many others in Winchester pushed for the inclusion of a fish ladder here. So that was put in. So now fish can go not only past the center of Winchester, but all the way up to Horn Pond. And we see them congregating, trying to get into Horn Pond. And this is the next big lake. This is like the next kind of um, gold uh, standard uh, breeding habitat for these fish. And we're incredibly excited to get them there. Uh, the, I, I, I was tweeting out, um, a, herring video uh, uh, this week and the commissioner of the uh, Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game retweeted my post which I was honored by but he said let's we're shooting for a million fish in the in the Mystic River and that at, that is what they're predicting like if we can open up robustly Horn Pond to uh, fish passage uh, we will um, this may be a million fish run which would make it the biggest if not one of the biggest, the only other big, big million fish run is on the Herring River in Cape Cod. Um, and what's what's uh, even more exciting about Horn Pond is that there is, uh, over the next few months, a lot of money coming to Horn, to Winchester, to Woburn, and to uh, the uh, other stakeholders here uh, to build um, a very, a kind of state of the art robust fish passage to Horn Pond, M money from a national resource damages settlement in the upper uh, watershed and money from the North uh, American Wetlands Conservation Act. Um, it, it, this, this will be built over the next few years and then we can expect to see another installment of that story we just looked at. Um, what super important and what's really interesting to us now is to get numbers of how many fish are making it through there as we'll see a little bit of fish passage here we want to get these baseline numbers so that we can show the the what we expect to be a a, um, a, a big increase down down uh, stream let me peek at these questions um yes so there is something in the work to open up horn pond and um and uh and um, that is uh, the next, as I say, installment in this story. So this is a little bit of an aside. Um, I won't spend much time here, but so the, all, everything we know about the run that I've told you about numbers and that the state knows, these are official numbers from the state. Um, 
the only reason they exist is because volunteers went out to count uh, herring and um, but we have a, I, I accidentally went ahead, but I'll show this video anyway. We have also a video camera installation at, um, at Upper Mystic Lake. And we, I, I won't go on about this, but it's a, it's an, a great kind of completely separate uh, a survey. You can count fish online. This was a, a day in May in 2018 when they were just kind of flying by. This is, this is not sped up. This is real time. This is fish migrate. You know, they're really motivated to get upstream. And so they've just climbed that ladder, right? They've made all those steps. And this is the last step. This is where you'll be counting as well. This is the last step into Upper Mystic Lake from the right of the screen into the left of the screen. And um, it was kind of just a remarkably, uh, uh, the, when they're going fast, they're going super fast. Um, Anyway, that's the video program. We can tell you more about it, but I won't. Uh, this is the website. You can go register. You can um, count fish. What's up right now is last year's fish, but we have the camera in the water and we'll be opening that up soon. And I think that's it for me. I will. <laughs> hey, Certainly... Andy, there are a couple of questions. Yep. Do you see the Q&A? box it's different from the chat box um oh yeah okay great hold on mm -hmm. uh the error bars seem to go up as the population increases um now you're going to tax my um statistical knowledge here um let me hold on let me try to get back whoops Um, let me get back to that graph for a second. I think, well, I, I can speak to that a bit. I think you'd expect, get all things equal, you'd expect the error bars to increase as the number estimated increases, but as a percentage of the total, you'd, all things equal, you'd expect that to stay the same. But these are that right. So these are error bars. These are you know, it's seven hundred, six hundred and seventy fish plus or minus forty thousand. Right. That's how to. That's what that's depicting. And um, but um, and this is kind of a. It actually introduces a key point. Um, in two thousand eighteen, I happen to know that the reason this error bar is proportionately bigger, and it is, is that that for a variety of reasons, nobody, nobody's fault in particular, we had a couple of weeks where there were few people counting. And so the number of the confidence of the estimate uh, depends on the density of data points we have. So that's why we count um, every hour um, and of the day. And in 2018, there were specific days, a, a number of them that had um, very sparse data points. And so the confidence you can have in the estimate for those days is much lower than it would be for if you had more data points. So the these bars will increase, I think, as the total number goes up, but not as a proportion, all things equal. And all things equal, the more data we have, that is the more, more, more counts per day that we have, um, the, the, low, the smaller the error bars will be. Um, and for horn pond numbers for last year, so this is another good example of the same um, phenomenon actually. We've been counting at horn pond for two years. In the first year, we just had a few observers and a very sparse number of data points, but they can take the, those samples, those observations, and run their statistical model and say, okay, we est using this sparse amount of data, we can make an estimate. And the estimate in that first year was 25,000 plus or minus 18,000, right? So it could have been 7,000 or it could have been 43,000. We don't know, but it's somewhere in there probably, right? That's uh, so, but that's because there were very few data points. Last year, we had many, many more. And so we had a more confident count 
last year. And last year, the estimated number based on observers counts, making it up that little fishway to the right um, of the dam was 10,000. So the evidence is that it, things haven't increased in the past couple of years, N no surprise, um, although they probably have increased a little bit because they've made that passage better. But until this real robust passage is put in, we don't expect those numbers uh, going up. Um, another question is, is the camera at Mystic replacing people counting this year? And I, we, we can talk about this later. Unfortunately, the answer is yes to that. Um, because we, well, well, we can talk about this. We were at, we made the decision, a kind of collective decision among all the stakeholders, including DMF and DCR, not to do in-person counts at Upper Mystic Lake this year um, for because of coronavirus, um, just totally erring on the side of minimizing risk to both, not only observers, but um, to the people who service the dam. And so, we're going to, we, the camera will be counting and um, we will be looking to those numbers to give us a sense of what's happening at Upper Mystic Lake. Um, and then finally, if, uh, I'll just go on to answer this final question in the Q of Q and A. Do the fish migrate only during the day? Um, it turns out in our system, so we actually, there's an infrared um, light on that camera. And so we were able a couple of years ago to, um, to analyze the counts from nighttime videos. It, it's fussy to set it up, but we had it dialed in for a certain specific amount of time. And um, we could see that um, as much as 20% of fish that came through the dam, according to the video estimates, was came outside of that 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. period that we count, um, but only in the, at the very edges, only at sort of dusk and dawn. In the deep night, very few fish were making it up this, this ladder. This turns out to be different on the Cape, for instance, where in, in open streams that have no protection, um, fish tend to move at night and they think they think that that's because they're avoiding uh, bird predators in particular who would they would be in these low open things with no trees around shallow streams would be just like sitting sitting ducks for the for the herons and so forth and so they in that system they actually move preferentially more at night than during the day but anyway that's the end and I will pause now mm -hmm. to hand it over to Erica all right, thank you. Let's see. All right, are you seeing my screen? Okay, can you hear me, Andy? Great, okay. Yeah. All right, so where to monitor? This is just looking down at Horn Pond. Um, you can see in the middle of this photo, I know it's grainy, it's a satellite image from Google Maps. Um, you could see the dam and to the right of that is a spillway. And the spillway is actually where the river herring are going to swim up to get into Horn Pond. And so we will be counting um, just standing adjacent to that. So if you go to the Horn Pond boat launch, you will just walk um, a quick walk to the dam and you will walk around this chain link fence. And you'll see Horn Pond, the spillway here, and there is actually a, um, there was a hole cut in the fence, an entryway, so that you can get past it and actually stand and look right down at the spillway. And I did see a question in the chat about um, fish having difficulty getting up the spillway last year. And so DMF um, is Division of Marine Fisheries. They are aware of this and um, I know towards the, end of the season last year and then as well this year they will be 
making adjustments to this spillway to enable easier passage um, while we are waiting for uh, improved fish, fish passage that will come um, later this year and next year with the funding that Andy had mentioned. So hopefully they will have an easier time getting up this year, but you'll see them um, swimming up and into Horn Pond from this view. And again, this PowerPoint will be sent to everyone. So you can look at this again. Um, you can reach out to me if you're confused. So materials, everyone will get a clicker to count the fish that are coming up the spillway. Um, we recommend using a timer or just remind yourself when you are beginning uh, your count, count for 10 minutes, which I'll get into in just a moment. Um, polarized sunglasses. In previous years, we have uh, provided a pair of glasses at the uh, spillway, but this year to minimize risk with coronavirus, we're going to ask that people bring their own glasses and having polarized lenses really does help to be able to see the fish um, better. We'll also use a data sheet. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about this process in a moment, but everyone will have their own data sheets um, or a log sheet that you'll bring to the dam to record what you're seeing. And then you will use your phone or a computer to submit the data online. And this is so that you know, in past years, we would have data sheets at the monitoring location and you would take one um, out of a box, write down what you're seeing and put it back into a secure location at the site. But again, to minimize risk, um, we're asking that you bring your own sheet and then record it electronically. So this is a change, but I'm going to walk through that process with you. Uh, it is a little easier to use this electronic data sheet um, on a computer interface rather than your phone, but you can make a shortcut on your phone on the home screen um, to access it that way too. So I'm sorry, this I also should have edited this slide. There will be no mailbox on the fence this year because again, we're reducing um, contact, reducing any kind of touching so that um, we are not spreading coronavirus germs. So the process, you will make sure that your clicker is set to zero. You will watch herring as they are traveling up the spillway. You'll count for 10 minutes and log this on your data sheet that you will bring from home. You will take that home with you and submit the data online. And we will have a form that I will email out to everyone where you will just click on a link and it will allow you each time that you are monitoring to submit that day's um, information. So this is an example of the paper data sheets that you'll use to record um, what you're seeing. And this might make a little difference since we are, um, we'll send you a, a file to use. Um, we might just make it easier to tally this information on one log sheet for you. Um, but the information we will ask to record is just your name, the time that you began and the date, what the weather was like and how many fish that you saw. And there will be a comment section so that you can let us know um, if you have any questions or concerns or you're seeing uh, interesting animals. So you're, you're welcome to let us know your thoughts during your shift. So we are going to go now to see this electronic form. So this is um, a form we used in 2018, but it will be very similar. We're still in process of creating this for 2020. But you'll see the date, the time that you started, the location, um, which will actually just have Horn Pond, the time, and it's just standard keyboard entry. It's very easy to use. And same options that are on the data sheet. So you will really just transcribe what you have on your data sheet into this um, form. 
click submit. I won't do that this time, but um, you get the idea. You fill out all of these fields, click submit, and then we will have your, um, your data from that monitoring shift. We are going to ask that you try to do this as soon as you get home or the day that you monitor, just to uh, make sure that we are collecting the data as accurately and efficiently as we can and that we don't lose any counts. So I will certainly send out this link um, after we get everything set up. So again, you'll go to the spillway, count the fish that are the herring that are swimming up the spillway, log the information on your paper data sheet and take that home with you so that there's a paper record of what you saw and you will submit the data online using a link that I will send out to you um, as soon as we can. Erica, this is Andy. Yeah. May I just jump in with one sure. point on that last of course. one? Um, what we're trying to measure is the number of fish that actually enter Horn Pond. So just to clarify number step two here. Thank you. It says, look for herring that successfully make it that little final jump into mm -hmm. calm water at the top of that spillway. That just a point of clarification. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's important. So what happens to the data? I think Andy mentioned earlier, but we will conduct these 10 minute observations and this data will be sent to the Division of Marine Fisheries and it will be um, put into a sophisticated statistical model that will estimate the size of the total migrating population or the number of fish in this case that have entered Horn Pond. So I will send out the calendar um, very soon so you have confirmation of your shift time. Um, that being said, if you do not have to arrive at the same time each week. So if your observation time, um, if your shift is, for example, at 1 p.m., you do not have to arrive one, exactly at 1 p.m. And it's actually um, better if your time is, is um, different each week. So you could go at 1 p.m. one day, 1.45 the next week, 1.30 the next. Um, it is okay if you, you have to come at the same time each week, but it's um, if you can make it varied, that is great. And each monitoring shift is very important. As Andy mentioned, the accuracy is dependent on the density of counts that we receive. So if you cannot make a shift, even if it's last minute, you can let me know. Um, you can email me or text me and I will provide my phone number. Um, and in hopes that we can find a substitute so it, that we'll have a greater, um, greater S accuracy with this estimate in reducing those error bars and uncertainty. Just a couple of notes about safety. Um, all monitors need to sign a waiver. So to sign up for a specific shift, you actually already have completed your waiver. But if you plan on having your family or someone in your household come with you, um, please have them contact me and we will get an electronic waiver to them. Youth can also participate with a parent or guardian. And I do recommend wearing waterproof slip resistant shoes. This monitoring site is um, natural. It's sandy, there are rocks, the, the uh, water level changes. So you just want to make sure that you are being safe and, uh, and don't fall while you're out there. And in regards to coronavirus, again, we really want to minimize any chance of risk. So maintain proper physical distancing protocols. Um, I just saw the CDC is recommending that we wear masks. So, you know, bring a mask with you, wear gloves, don't touch your face and wash your hands thoroughly before and after. So we do just ask you to be as, um, as safe and health conscious as you can. So how do you find your shift? 
I will send out an email um, next week, and this will include all of the information you need to know. It will have um, this PowerPoint, the calendar that will look like this image on the screen. Um, we'll have my phone number. It will have a cheat sheet for Horn Pond. It will have the link for the electronic data collection form. So everything will be sent to you, do not worry. Um, but this link again will be included. So all you have to do is click on the link and it will show you the weekly calendar um, with your shift. And your shift is, is the same thing that you signed up for when you registered to monitor river herring. I just um, input it into a Google calendar and it will show here. So each week, any shifts that are not covered by a monitor, whether um, it was never claimed or whether someone is unable to attend that week, if it's open, it will show up in red and it will say open. And every week I will send out an email to any monitors who um, signed up to be substitutes and you'll be able to claim a shift if you're able. And if you do want to be listed as a substitute, just send me a note um, and I can add you to that list. And now we will get to questions. I see that um, there are several in the Q&A box. And also in the chat. Yeah. OK. Ah. Thank you. So the parking lot is closed. So I unfortunately I did not know that. So we will have to figure out a good option. Um, I'll look into that and then include that in the next email that is going out. What year was the dam in Winchester made herring friendly? I think the fish ladder there was put in in 2016. Do we need to obtain our own clickers? So that's a great question. I actually did order clickers for everyone. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to distribute these. It might be that I leave a box of the clickers at Horn Pond at the monitoring site, and there, you know, you'll just have to maybe touch that one time, or um, we can figure out some kind of delivery system. But I do have clickers um, that we can get to you and we can be very careful about, you know, wiping them down and wearing gloves as we're doing that transfer. Is it useful to conduct several 10 minute counts within an hour? Um, Andy, maybe you have a good answer for this one. Um, I, I have an answer. I'm not sure it's a good one. Uh, uh, the, um, I, I think the short answer is no. Um, I, I don't actually know if we, we sometimes get the extra 10 minute counts um, and we submit them. I'm not sure what the modelers do with that information. That is, so uh, the best case is that, or they do e either of two things. They either average the two and get a single estimate for that hour or they um or they throw out um all but one and i i don't know what they what they would do what they do on the other end um but we actually ask that people don't do that but rather if you have extra effort that you can apply um Actually, this year, go count on videos online. That would be great uh, at Upper Mystic Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, but also um, um, find a slot that hasn't been taken. The way the, the way these estimates work is they're trying to get a rate of fish estimated rate of fish passage for four hour periods, and they they end up averaging the samples you give them. Um, but a lot relies on the idea that we're going at in these kind of um, in, in these sort of uh, hour long periods that we're getting random samples from within those hour long periods. The sort of the the ability to be confident in your prediction relies on the, that kind of randomness. So that's why that they actually prefer you don't start at the same time every time, but move that 
start time around randomly. Um, although that's not a critical factor, um, but um, uh, it won't it won't sort of you, you should think of it as you're getting a snapshot there of the rate of fish passage in that period, and then the um, leave it to other people to get other other time periods. Mm -hmm. All right. So do passerby inquire about what monitors are doing and is there a preferred way to answer people's questions? Um, you might get questions. I think this year people might be um, hesitant to walk up and, and talk to folks because of our concerns with coronavirus. Um, that being said, if you are comfortable talking to someone within social distancing rules, um, you can let them know that there is a river herring migration and that you are working with the Mystic River Watershed Association to monitor the herring so that we can get a, um, have a better understanding of the fish populations in the Mystic. Um, I'm also going to be putting some signage around Horn Pond so that people know that the migration is happening. Um, I think you know the more information we can put out in advance and be proactive, um, we can reduce some of those questions. And this year, I think that's probably what we want to do just so that we're minimizing risk again. When does it start? We will begin monitoring on Sunday, April 14th. You live there by bike. That's fantastic. If anyone can bike there, uh, that's probably the uh, going to be a great option with the parking lot closed. But again, I will look into uh, what other options we do have. And there's a couple of other questions. So um, in the photos I showed you of the Horned Pond location um, to monitor, go back to this slide. So it's not a very large area. Once you walk through the, um, the doorway, essentially, that was cut into the fence, there's not a very large um, area to stand on. So I think it will actually be pretty obvious once you actually, actually are there on site. Um, as long as you have a good view, of this the spillway here, um, that's all that we're that we're looking for. And thank you for the questions on the clickers. I think um, rather than trying to figure out the the process right now uh, for distribution, I will reach out to a couple of you who have um, indicated interest in helping with that, and I'll talk with Andy, and we'll figure out a good process for getting you um, the clicker. We did not order timers for everyone. Um, one thing that might be helpful is to set the timer on your phone. Um, just keep that in your back pocket so it doesn't get in the water. And Erica, there are a couple yes. of more questions about the 10 minute counts. And I'll just, just- Oh, great, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so someone asked, how about 10 minutes at the end of one hour and another 10 minutes at the beginning of mm. the next? Um, I, I could, that would be uh, totally fine to do if you were signed up for both of those slots. So mm -hmm. I can imagine um, that there is a need for a substitute and you happen to notice that, that the need for that substitute is in the hour right after you count. Um, and it would be totally fine to count in your, during your hour waiting a bit or mm -hmm. uh, till the next hour. But again, the priority, it's, it's much, much more important that we get one count per hour than it is that we get multiple counts in any given hour because mm -hmm. they'll all get, they'll all get uh, the average. It's sometimes a little bit frustrating because you, you, and there's another question about what's the average count for 10 minutes, what should we expect? You should not expect that rate of fish passage we saw in the video. Um, there, there are gonna be few, many fewer fish coming up here. I think the maybe the highest was 100 uh, last season, 
you're good. You should expect a lot of zeros, um, and it's, it's certainly in the beginning of the season. That's true at, at Mystic Lake as well. The the fish tend to arrive in waves, um, and the height of migration is sort of mid May typically. Um, so in the early in the early uh, weeks, you should expect zero, but don't be um, either discouraged by that or um, think that's not important because it really is important. If a zero, if somebody goes and says, I counted for 10 minutes and I counted zero, that's real data. If we don't have a count for that period, we have no idea what happened in that period. So zero is a really important data point. And um, um, we, we can even say more about that. There, there I've read statistical, um, um, you know, uh, uh, science communication that helps explain exactly why that's important, and maybe we'll we'll make that a kind of a blog entry later. But but zero data points are important, um, uh, and uh, again, we're trying to take a baseline of what's happening at this site so that we can really understand what the impact of the real fish passage is later on, um, uh, and. To both to sort of to document what success story is waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. All right, there's one other question about um, the 10 minute counting shift. And so I do just want to reiterate that you only need to count for one 10 minute shift. Um, so you don't need to do 10 minute intervals or more than one per hour. Um, just one 10 minute shift is helpful. There's also a comment that you can park on the east side of Horn Pond along Arlington Street. One question, do we stand by the lower spillway or on the dam at the edge of the lake? And so standing um, by the spillway is actually where we want you to be. You can see a lot of herring right um, on the sidewalk in front of the dam as they're pooling at the at the bottom or schooling, sorry. Um, but that is not where we where we want the um, where we want monitors to stand because we're really trying to track how many are, are successfully swimming into Horn Pond. So there is one, the question is, um, I'm familiar with the area. It looks like there's a locked gate. Will that gate remain unlocked? So there is a locked gate along the sidewalk, um, but we are actually walking around that. And we do have permission from the mayor to be um, on the site around. Let's see if I can move to a different photo. So here, if you could see my mouse, this is the locked gate. It's right past the bridge. It's in front of the dam. And we are walking all the way around it. And then kind of where the, the tip of this arrow is, there has, um, there's now an opening in the fence so that you can walk through that. And you're standing uh, at the edge of the spillway here. And one thing I will do, since we can't be in person, I'll go and take a video of this, and I can send that out. Um, in our communications prior to April 14th, when this will start. Great question. If you have to self quarantine for any reasons, or if you're not feeling well, um, or if you're unable to make your shift, feel free again, just to let me know. It's, we totally understand and you can send me an email or send me a text message and I will provide you with that contact information. Is it acceptable to wait across the spillway to count from the other side if lighting conditions make better visibility from there? You know, I actually don't know the answer to this question. So that is one that I can look into. Andy, do you have any insight on that or should we? I'm tempted to for, for multiple reasons, including, mm -hmm. and maybe first of all, safety. Safety, yeah. Um, to just say, 
No, but there may be a, another reason would be just consistency. So if everyone's ah. coming from the same spot, um, arguably that's um, that's better uh, mm -hmm. than um, just sort of reduce variability in mm -hmm. um, in observer. Uh, uh, you know, the details surrounding the observation, I think. Um, but I, I think for safety, I think we should say, don't don't take that extra step of waiting across yes, um, okay. and, uh, and just stay on that side, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one other comment is that there are some photos of people um, who look like they're counting at the dam here at Horn Pond. And we're just confirming that you can see the fish from the bridge it's right in front of the dam but that's not where we are asking you to monitor from um i think i hope you've gotten through all the questions and just one one yeah. final point on on that in the in this in the screenshot that's right now visible like mm -hmm. that's where uh right this is where you would be standing essentially right it's only well, there's, there's one other step like in this chain link fence you're seeing right in front of us in this image uh, there's now basically a, an entryway like it's been cut so you can walk through that okay perfect um but again we're 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 hoping that people that we're what we're trying to count is not how many fish you see because if you go to the bottom of that spillway you'll see sometimes hundreds schooling down there it just is just to reemphasize this point and as as heartbreaking as it is that we wish that we could get them up the up the hill, um, uh, we're it's not that we're not interested in that, but the count you should make should not include any of those fish. They should include only fish that kind of cross this finish imaginary finish line here and make it into the the kind of still water at the top here. What we're counting is number of fish entering Horn Pond because they you can imagine they come and this happens in the spillway for sure in the other one for sure. Um, they make it halfway up and then get swept back or change their mind and turn around. What we want to know is how many how many fish cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I say that just because for a view of that, you really have to be quite close to it, I think, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't get a good view um, from, from uh, other locations. Yeah. So a couple other questions about actually where to stand. So I will certainly go out and take a video of this. I will walk from the sidewalk around the fence to exactly where um, I'm talking about so that you have a better idea. And again, I'll send out my cell phone number in an email. So if you're going to your shift and you're not sure where you're supposed to be standing, um, if you have a smartphone, you could, we could FaceTime, you could show me and we can I can walk you through the exact spot. Um, one other question, can we share this year's data with counters to see what our work has done? Andy, can we share live data? Um, can you um, clarify which data? The, the current data that people are collecting on for the 2020 run. Oh, you mean as it's going on? Yes. Um, sure. Um, I don't. I don't see why not. I get. I'm. I'm pausing only because if we. What or after want, I got. I. You, I guess they didn't specify. We'll do it. Um, if you promise not to have it affect your behavior. So if you <laughs> see a lot of zeros, and that makes you say, "Ah, I'm not going to go because I, I don't want to count zero then we don't want to show it to you because of what, what again sort of you you want to be as neutral a uh, kind of sensor in the field as you can be and you want to go in with no kind of preconceptions about how many you might see and so um uh but other than that i i i, I don't see why not the the real place to watch how many fish well in any case upper mystic lake is that video count and there you can there you ah, get almost the immediate theory. feedback okay. you, Oh, at the end of the year. Oh, end yes. of the year for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, at at Mystic Lake on the video thing, if you enter a count, it actually does the calculation of the different statistical model it's using and generates a new total count estimate using your last data point. So that's kind of cool. It it you you get uh, instantaneous feedback there. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I will just say a quick reminder that um, you'll get an email again with, with this training presentation with a cheat sheet of what to do. We will also have um, all the information about how to get your clicker, um, my cell phone number, the electronic link to the to submit data. Um, so expect a communication communications from me uh, shortly. And then after that, every week, if you would like to be a substitute monitor to take any shifts people can't make, just send me a note. If you indicated that you were interested in that when you signed up, I already have you listed. Otherwise, feel free to send me another email if you have any other questions, but we really appreciate you joining us today and look forward to working with you this spring. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you and thank you for helping us document what I think, again, is a remarkable wildlife migration um, through the center of Boston. You know, it's 600,000 fish stretched end to end. They're big fish, they're decent sized fish, is a hundred miles worth of river herring. Um, it's a really kind of remarkable thing. Um, and um, and it really will inform the restoration work that's going on at Horn Pond. So thank you. Great, thank you all, take care.